Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Tis a few days until Christmas, and we're back with another episode of Fireside Chat. This is our last episode for the 2014 calendar year. And Matt, can you believe that this is our 65th episode of the show? It's awesome that we've actually hit this point. And it's awesome that we've had a lot of really positive stuff to talk about with the Flames so far. Yeah, unlike the last couple games, but, it, you know, rebuilding, it's always going to have ups and downs. For the most part this season, we've had all positives to talk about. This team has, by all accounts, outdone what everyone thought they were going to do. We've outperformed everyone's expectations, and now the Flames have run into a bit of an issue. We're going into tonight's game against the Kings, which is only a few hours away, with an eight-game losing streak. We talked a little bit about it last week, and you were b- very brave and thought that we might take all four games last week. And we took maybe, well, we got one point against the Canucks. But, Matt, why do you think the Flames can't kick this losing streak? It's just uh, one of those things where when a team's winning, towards the end of their winning streak, you'll start to see bad habits enter their game. And we saw that in all those comeback games in the late part of November. And now that we're losing, we're having to get back to getting the right plays down. And it's just not going as smoothly as we'd like. However, in the last couple of games, they have been a lot more coherent in their play. More like what they were when they were actually being successful. Yeah, I mean, that Dallas game, as you said before we started recording, if we didn't score on ourselves, we probably would have had a chance at that one. Yeah, well, even the Vancouver game, that game wouldn't have went to overtime, and the Dallas game would have. So, you know, it it sucks that they're losing, but it seems like they're getting closer to actually winning and what better having two games next week against Edmonton. For sure, yeah. But to go with the games against Edmonton, we also have two games against the Kings. True. If you look at the la- I mean, the whole losing streak, really, we have been competitive. We're losing by one, maybe two goals every time. And even the games like the Pittsburgh game two weeks ago, um, you know, the I'd even say the Rangers game, when the Flames have lost by a couple goals, we haven't looked like we're lost out there. The Flames, to me, have looked competitive in pretty much every outing. Yeah, the Rangers game was pretty much the only stinker of the eight-game losing streak. Even the Pittsburgh game, for the most part of the game, the Flames were right there. It's just a lot late goal that sunk them. And uh, same thing with the Toronto game, where they gave up two empty netters, and you look at the score, and it's 4-1, but really, until the last minutes, it was 2-1. For sure. Yeah, so uh, to me, I think it's important to note that even though we're losing, this team is not looking like they're floundering. They don't look like, you know, they're totally lost against some of these teams, and to me, that's a positive sign that we're going to see some sort of a rebound. Yeah, and... Sometimes you just get bad bounces, and, like, there was, there's been plays where, like, 99 times out of 100, that puck will bounce off the guy and in instead of just, you know, going off to the side or whatever. It's just that everything seems to be going against the Flames at the moment. Like, you look at the two goals that they scored on themselves, you know... Like, how often does that happen? And then to have that basically being the deciding goal in back-to-back games, like, really? (laughs) I've seen some interesting conversation online this week about people talking about this losing streak and the development for young players like uh, Granlin and Goudreau with the losing streak. And I've seen some thoughts that the losing streak is probably good for these guys because it teaches them how to take a loss as a pro and potentially rebound from it and keep their game fairly consistent. I've seen other people who think that having these losses is terrible for the young guys and they should probably be sent back to Adirondack where they're going to win more games, 
What do you think, Matt? It's one of those things that you can't overreact. And like, if the Flames lost like 18 or 20 games in a row, then maybe you consider returning some guys to Adirondack. But that's not going to happen. These players need to learn how to fight through adversity. And this has really been the first stretch since we started the rebuild two years ago that they've actually been up against it really badly. So you need to have that availability to take lessons from new situations. Not everything's going to be sunshine and roses, and you need to know how to overcome situations like this. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think Goudreau, Granlin, the young guys that are up here right now, they have to learn to fight through this. They have to learn how to keep their games consistent even though they're losing and take some of that emotion out of it. And I think if you just return them to the farm where it's easy when the going gets tough, they're not going to get those lessons, which is really what they need in order to be top tier NHL players in their future. Exactly. And like we've seen that Goudreau all through this losing streak has been the best guy on the team. So it's not just it's not like he's gone off to the wayside and everybody else is trying to adapt. He's been the guy. It's just the rest of the team's been kind of off for the yeah. last eight games. Well, we talked about this in the last episode, too, and I think on the last week, uh, Marcus Granlund was probably the best player as well. So seeing that those two guys are keeping a high level of performance during the losing streak is really promising. Yeah, and it, some fans get frustrated like, oh, we're in a playoff spot and now we should be going for it. But we're only two years into a rebuild. And like I've seen online that like guys like Poirier and that like people want them back in the lineup but you're also taking away from the one of the top teams in the AHL at the moment and it's better for this group of prospects to learn how to win together so when they do come up like they'll have that bond together of you know winning and understanding how to win. Well, and it's not as though the lineup that we currently have in the NHL can't win. I mean, they've shown us all season. This team knows how to win hockey games at the NHL level. So I don't think you necessarily need to replace a lot of those guys. You just have to get whatever kinks are in their game sorted out so they can go back to winning. Exactly. If we hadn't won all year long, I'd say, yeah, maybe it's time to start changing some personnel drastically. But, I mean, up till this eight-game losing streak, we were winning most of our games. Exactly, and it's frustrating, but it it's a rebuild. It's not linear. You can't just, okay, we've won X number of games, we're just going to continue on this smooth road all the way. It's going to, there are going to be down periods. It sucks, but it, the players will learn from that, hopefully, and moving forward, there will be less of this, uh, especially when the Adirondack players get more experience, then they can come up and bring their talents as well. And I don't know about you, but I knew at some point this season this was coming. I mean, the Flames have had such a great start, an unprecedented start, some that none of us expected that you knew at some point this, I didn't think it was going to be this long all in a row, but I knew that at some point we'd start to see this team bottom out a little bit. Well, the thing is, is that you have to account for other teams scouting the Flames and adapting to how Calgary plays, because the Flames' main driver offensively has been the defense. Well, you can interfere with that if you have your players positioned in the right way, and it takes time for the Flames to adapt to not having those open lanes for the defensemen to pinch in this, that, the next thing. Like, we've seen in the last eight games that players have been getting caught where they weren't before. And that's led to two-on-ones, three-on-twos that have resulted in goals against. Yeah. No, for, for sure. And you're right. The Flames have to learn, I think, how to adapt their game a little bit now. I think they've been playing one way all year, and it's like, okay, we've been scouted. People figured us out a little bit, so let's work with what we've got and try to come up with something different here. Mm -hmm. And with the defensemen getting neutralized a bit 
the lack of scoring talent on amongst the Flames forwards is starting to get exposed a bit. Like, realistically, if you look at the Flames' forward lineup, there's only four legitimate top six forwards. And... And who do you feel those four are? Uh, Glenn Cross, uh, Hoodler, Monaghan, and Goudreau. And after that, you're... You've got some good third-line guys and just a lot of middle-of-the-road roster filler types and no con- real consistent... Like, the Flames don't really have, like, a Jerome Ginla style of top-notch first-line forward. And the Flames are lacking that at the moment. And now we're seeing that get exposed a bit because of the defensemen not being able to score at will. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, the roster is looking the way I expected it to going into a second year of a rebuild. You and I talked at the beginning of the season about how, you're right, we're missing some key pieces, but... I think in the second year of our rebuild, we weren't expecting them to be there. And I think that we've given these guys a chance to try and step up into roles that a lot of them shouldn't have played or didn't think they'd play. I mean, Josh Juris is a prime example of that. So I think that it's, you're right, it is a weakness that's being exposed. And it's something I think the organization knows they need to get, but also is going to take time to address unless we want to sell big to, you know, increase that position right now. Yeah, and realistically, this season shouldn't matter. Like, every season matters, but you know what I mean. Like, the onus should be on improving for an eventual cup run two or three years from now. And to rush out and get a couple of good top forwards, that's going to eat a lot of the potential to win a cup a couple years from now. Yeah, and if I look at the roster already, I would already say that, I mean, we're Christmas right now. And I think this season's success. If you look at the number of young players that have emerged, Granlin, Goudreau, Juris, um, I'd say even, you know, Paul Byron really coming into his own as an NHL caliber player. I think you can already look at this season and say it's a success in terms of where we wanted to be after the second year of the rebuild. Oh, especially when you add in that Adirondack is one of the top teams and all the teams that are ahead of them are veteran-laden squads where Adirondack is almost all rookies. For sure. Yeah, so I think, you know, halfway through the year, we can already call this year a success in terms of what we want out of the rebuild. Will it be disappointing if the Flames don't make the playoffs after their great start? Sure it will. But it's not as though the team is disappointing if we look back at where we were in September. Yeah. Like, if the Flames end up, say, picking fifth overall this year, say, like, the wheels come off and, like, they drop like a rock in the standings, well, that actually isn't far off of where pretty much everybody expected this team to be once the season got underway. So, while it would be disappointing to see the Flames sink in the standings, you know, that there are 82 games, and while we were great through the first 25, 30 of them... It's going to level back out. Exactly. And it, as long as the management doesn't rush things, then the Flames will be fine. I almost look at this eight-game losing streak that we're on as a reality check for the Sea of Red. I think we all got so high on this team at the beginning of the year. We all got so excited, and, you know, people start talking about playoffs and all that. And I think that this eight-game losing streak is really a bit of a reality check. Saying, look, this team is not flawless. This team can lose. And we're seeing that now. And I think we have to reevaluate our expectations as a fan base as to where this team's going to end up this year. Oh, definitely. And... It's nice that they went on such a great streak at the beginning of the year, but we are in the second year of a rebuild, and how many times does a team that's in a situation like Calgary actually sustain being that good all the way through? It's very rare. Yeah, it is. And I think you put it best there, a team like Calgary. We've seen teams do it, but those teams that bonafide first line, even second line forwards... Yeah, like if you look at, say, uh, Ottawa and Colorado in recent years, like Anaheim, or Ottawa, I mean, uh, they had Spezza and Alfredson plus a whole bunch of guys, and both of those players were first-line talents. And then you look at Colorado last year, they had McKinn and Landis Cog, 
Duchesne, Stastny. While they were rebuilding teams in each case, they had a lot more of legitimate top six forwards, top line forwards, where Calgary pretty much just has Gaudreau as a legitimate top line forward. Well, and I would argue that those two teams are further along in the rebuild process than we are as well. True. So, yeah, no, I think it will come, but if I look at the performance we got out of this team in the first 25 games, I think we got in the first 25 games the the performance I was expecting for the entire year. I think, you know, not that these guys run out of gas, but I think maybe the Flames' magic has run out at this point, and we're going to start to see them for what they are. Well, I think they can rebound a bit. But I think they're going to rebound a bit, but I don't think we're going to get another 25-game stretch like the first one. Oh, no. Uh, it, we'd have to get some really good magic returning, and I don't see that. They're not going to lose from here on out, but they're not going to have another 25-game stretch like the first one. No. And if they do, they could actually possibly sneak into a playoff spot, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, time will tell. But it's been an interesting ride the first half of this uh, season, the 2014 half, just seeing what's gone on here. Yeah, and realistically, you have to be encouraged by the fact that the Flames were able to put a 25-game segment up that they did. And even though it hasn't been all great, at least that they're, the players are showing enough where like next year you can start to slowly increase your expectations instead of like if the flames were say in Edmonton territory in the standings then you might be going oh gee we really need this this and that instead of you know what I mean like yeah I think we've identified the pieces that we need now we've identified some of the young players that perhaps we didn't really see at the NHL level before and it's given the Flames a good look at what they have available to them in the system. Mm -hmm. So, Matt, there's one part of the roster that's been a bit troubling all year, and that's been the third-pairing defense uh, pair. They really haven't played all that much. Some nights that, that group has hardly been on the ice. That's always been England's pairing, which right now is the England-Diaz pairing. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about that last week. Interesting note that you pointed out today is that that pair has not been on the ice for any of the last 15 goals scored against for the Flames. So not perhaps the worst team or the worst pairing on the ice right now. But it got me thinking when we were talking last week, how do we get more from our third line pairing? Do you think that we have to play them more in order to you know, get more out of them? Or is it simply a case of the guys we have there are not capable of more? And if we wanted to get more out of that pairing, we'd have to change up the, the personnel. Honestly, I think that if we wanted to get more out of the third pairing, we'd have to acquire some new guys. Like, There's nothing wrong with England or Smeed or Diaz in and of themselves, but they're not vital guys to a defense core. And but most 5-6 guys aren't. No, but they're more like six, seven guys that, you know, like we've seen other teams like have seven, eight defensemen that are of the caliber of England and Diaz. Unfortunately, the Flames don't have anybody imminently better. Like, I know uh, Watherspoon's doing really good in Adirondack, but they're wanting him to just get like a more of a full season in. And, like, when he comes up to Calgary, he'll stay up in Calgary. So, like, unless you can acquire somebody through trade, I don't see these guys getting any better than they have been. Even though they, they've been okay, it's just they, they're they not as good as we would like. I think when I look at those three guys that made up that pairing all year, which is England, Diaz, and Smeed. Smeed's hurt right now. I think of those three, I would keep Smeed around. I think he has a role in in a depth defenseman role. Um, I would keep him on my team. I don't think England has a long-term role here. And, I mean, as we know, Diaz was signed at training camp to a one-year deal. So I would not be surprised if he's not around at the end of the year. But, yeah, I agree with you. I think that we need new guys there. I think we know what we have in these guys. It's not a matter of just playing them more to get more out of them. It is a weak pairing. Yeah. 
And unfortunately, in both Smeed and England's case, they have two more years after this. But, you know, like if you can get a quality number five and uh, bump Smeed down to number six and England to number seven, I think that would be more ideal. Yeah, England would be a good number seven who watches most games from the press box and comes in and needs some muscle on the blue line. Well, the good thing about England is that he can also slot in as a forward, and Pittsburgh actually used him in that manner quite a bit. So, With Boleg on the roster, though, and having McGratton sitting, I don't know I want to put another tough guy in the forward ranks. True. It's just the, he is versatile, and you could hypothetically use him as a right winger. Sounds like a good sales pitch if we're trying to move him. Yeah. So, other roster news. I guess the biggest piece of news that came out is uh, Bob Hartley's coming back. Bob Hartley's officially signed a two-year extension with the Flames. I imagine I can probably speak for you here and say that we're both thrilled about this. He is the first Flames coach in Calgary history to actually get an extension. Really? Yeah. Believe it or not. That surprises me if you look at some of the coaches that we've had over the years. Yeah, and... uh... If uh, he actually plays out his contract, he'll be the longest-serving coach in Flames history. Wow. Well, good for him. I think two years is the right number for Hartley. I don't know I want him here much longer than that, but I think it'll depend where we're at with the rebuild. I don't know that he's the guy when we become a contender, but I think two years is enough to see how we're doing, and then you know you can always re-up him again if you need to. Exactly. It, it's one of those things... Everything has gone pretty much perfectly since he's come aboard. So, you know, if until he hits the wall, which coaches sometimes do hit the wall and they just can't get any more out of it, then you go with somebody else. But if it, what he's preaching keeps working, then just sign him again afterwards. It, we won't know until then, though. And I think the thing here to me that hasn't been publicized a lot is we have to give kudos to Trill Living. So often general managers, especially newer general managers, want to put their own guy in place. They want to make their own mark. And for him to come in and take the previous coach and not only say, okay, I'm just going to leave you here and run out your contract, which we see, but take the last guy's coach, Feaster's coach, say, not only do I want to keep you here, but I want to re-up you. I think that that reflects very positively on true living of understanding the value of what's already here and not always just saying I need my people. Yeah, exactly. And realistically, who out there would get more out of what the Flames are currently than Hartley? Well, that's it. Yeah, and he's proven it. I mean, he's proven so far this year that he can do that. If the Flames had a poor start, I think that there may have been questions in the office about, okay, is this guy really bringing all that much value that nobody else could? But I think with the first 25 games Hartley managed to put together here, there's no question that he knows how to run this team. Yeah, and it's not like, even with the eight-game losing streak, it's not like they've played like crap the entire time. They've been right in it for almost all of the games, and a good bounce here and there, and instead of an eight-game losing streak, we might have won three or four of those games. So, you know, it, it's... he Even when we're losing, we're still doing good. You know, I was going back and watching some old interviews with Flames coaches on YouTube this week, Keenan and both Sutters, and a lot of those guys just never seemed like they enjoyed being here. They were always, you know, talking negatively. They didn't seem like they liked being in Calgary. And even when we're going through these hard times, it always seems like Bob Hartley just seems like he loves being the coach of this team. And I think that's really refreshing to see as a fan. And when the coach is optimistic, I know I stay optimistic as well. Yeah, and he's very lively personality-wise. So, like, that rubs off on the players. And, like, they seem more upbeat as a group. Instead and Hartley of, almost seems like he's one of the boys to me. Yeah, uh, instead of, like, under uh, Ginla, when uh, Sutter was the coach, like, everybody was very serious and, you know, like, I have to be focused on the game and no fun. And, you know, like, everybody is loosey-goosey on the bench, and that helps. Yeah, it does. And, yeah, no, you're right. It's 
It seems, I mean, we know it's a big business. We know it's serious to these guys, but I think Hartley understands the value of having fun playing hockey. And yeah, to me, it seems like he's just another one of the boys. I mean, I know you need that separation between coach and players, but when he's having fun and I think he can make his players have fun, they're going to react better to him. Well, it's one of those things that the Flames don't really need a drill sergeant at this point. They need somebody to assist them and be like a really good teacher. And, you know, like I know from when I was in school, my best teachers were always the ones that were more personable and friendly. And basically it's the same thing where you know, Hartley is teaching these guys how to be NHL players, and you need a friendly atmosphere for that instead of, oh, you must do it this way, this way, this way, and this way. For sure. Where, yeah. you, know, you know, like, it, say, like, a team like L.A., where, like, they had gone through their rebuild, they needed a guy like Daryl Sutter to come in and, okay, in order to win, we need to do this. Yeah, right coach at the right time. Yeah. And, like, that's why Hartley might not necessarily be the guy two or three years from now. But for now, you know, we're transitioning all these young kids that are, like, 18, 20 years old into the NHL. And, you know, it's not the same situation as guys that are 26, 27 and vying for a cup. Yeah. And I think that, you know, based on what Hartley's done here, I think that he will probably be back... Let's say in in two more years when his contract expires, we don't renew him. I think he's going to have no problem finding yet another NHL job. I think that he's really shown that he is among NHL-capable coaches. Oh, yeah. He would have teams lining up to, like, anybody who's rebuilding. Yeah. I'd take him if I was rebuilding. Yeah. Like, Edmonton, once, you know, the Flames are done, maybe Edmonton can use them to finally get out of their rebuild. (laughs) Could be. Yeah, I just, I don't see him being banished to Europe again. No, I think Hartley will have jobs wherever he wants now. Like, his career in Atlanta was not exactly great, and, like, it's understandable why he went to Europe, but... Now that he has a reputation for being able to make a rebuilding team play well, he won't have any trouble getting work. Now, I don't know. I haven't looked it up. I don't know when his assistant Jacques Cloutier and Martin Gellin, his contracts are up, but I imagine both those guys are going to be retained by the team as well. If I was Hartley, I'd say, hey, if I'm coming back, I want my two assistants back as well. Oh, yeah. Well, where Hartley goes, Cloutier goes, so... They've pretty much been working together since their Colorado days. Well, and I remember when we signed Hartley, it was immediately announced that he was bringing Cloutier with him. And I think the Jelenas really transitioned into part of that team very well. I, I like what I'm seeing from him as a coach. So I don't know when those contracts are up, but I don't see any coaching changes coming here. No. Like, if anything, we would add more assistance somewhere. Could be, yeah. And... And again, as you know, Hartley's probably got his eye on a couple guys he'd like to add to the staff. I imagine you always do at some some stage. Exactly. Well, Matt, as we wrap up 2014, then um, an interesting story has come out in the last part of this year, and it's the story about NHL expansion again. There's been some talk for a while about expansion in the league, but as of late, over the last couple months, the NHL seriously talked about expanding into Las Vegas. Um, some has been there for a while, but I think now it's probably more likely than ever as we finally have an owner who's been named and that sort of thing. What are your thoughts about having uh, NHL hockey in Sin City? Well, it will either be an exceptional thing or it will be a disaster, and I don't really think there's any in-between there. The arena will be located just off the strip, like a block away, so it's feasible that It could be successful, like, especially with casinos buying up tickets and comping them and all that. I don't know exactly how it would work, because I know Las Vegas isn't exactly the richest city for the people that live there all the time. I don't know. My question around that, too, would be what kind of local fan base are you going to get? I think that there's always going to be a ton of away fans. I mean, I could see myself saying, hey, the Flames are going to Las Vegas this weekend. Cheap flight, cheap rooms. Let's go down and see the Flames play there. 
But I think as a player, if there's not a lot of home fans, it's going to be a tough place to play in. Yeah, and like that's where a lot of my concerns is. Like I could see like every, all the other teams' fans going to Vegas and that, but I don't know. Like I know the Wranglers have been successful in the ECHL for a long time, but I don't know as if they have enough support for an NHL team. We'll see. It'll be interesting. Do you think that the Vegas team comes in by expansion and we get 31 teams, or do you think we'll see a team in Vegas through relocation? I think it'll be via expansion, just because uh, they the new owner has to pay expansion fees and all that, and it's like I a, heard it's upwards of a billion dollars that they want. Yeah, and you know that helps line the rest of the owners' pockets, so. Like, I could see a team like Florida getting relocated as well, but I don't see... Like, I, I think that the NHL will end up eventually having 32 teams uh, with two teams in the Western Conference. Like, I, I see, like, if Florida relocates, I could see them moving up to Quebec City or something like that instead and, like, having an expansion team in, say, Seattle or Kansas City to balance out the Western Conference with the East. Yeah, I think you could be right. And I th I think that we'll have 32 teams for a while. I think you might see that with two more teams added, we might see one or two teams contract shortly after that, um, especially if they don't move. If, say, Vegas comes in and Seattle comes in, I think that you might then see the Florida team go out of business. Um, but, yeah, I can see 32 teams for a while. I can't see any more than that, though. I think 30 teams is already a lot. And if you look at the talent around the league now, I think even 32 teams is going to be spreading the talent pool fairly thin. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting. I don't, like, I don't see 34 working. No. But, you know, 32, you'll just basically end up getting two teams that'll suck a little more than, you know, more competition for the number one overall pick for Edmonton. That's well, all. <laughs> and, you know, I always find it interesting when new teams come in to kind of see their whole process and how long it takes them. I remember in the last expansion, seeing the expansion draft and looking at these rosters saying, you pretty much have spare parts and a first overall pick because the new team always gets the first overall pick. And I always find it interesting to see how long it takes them to turn that around and make a, you know, a viable team out of it. So... I like the idea of expansion. If for no other reason as a fan, then it's something different. It's something new. Yeah, and like we could also be seeing a team like Phoenix relocate as well. Uh, so it, it it really depends. Like I don't know exactly how things are going to shake out. But as much as the owners want the billion dollars, I have a feeling it's probably going to be a tough sell to somebody to say, "Hey, give us a billion dollars for a team." I think oh, I'm a shrewd businessman who wants a team. I would say. Gary, why would I pay you this when I can buy a team already and move them there? Yeah, like you could hypothetically buy the Coyotes for like say four hundred million and move them, even if that costs you an extra two hundred million. You know, it's still less than a billion. If we had thirty profitable teams, I could see them saying, "Hey, you want a piece of this? This is what it costs to get in on the action." But having teams like Phoenix and Florida that are in more of a dire financial strait, I I think as a businessman, I'd say, well, why would I buy an expansion team from you when I can just relocate one that's there? And we know the league is open for relocation because we saw them relocate uh, Atlanta back to Winnipeg. Yeah, like everything we'll see over the next six months, and it'll be interesting. Do you think that Vegas will be the next NHL market, though? Oh, yeah, for sure. And I could see Quebec being next in line after that and either Kansas or Seattle beyond that. I just hope that whoever buys the Vegas team does not name them the Gamblers. Oh, I hope that there's absolutely nothing to do with gambling or casinos or like the Black Aces or anything stupid and kitschy like that. They're, they're probably going to do a naming competition as every team does, but if, if it, you guys haven't seen this, you should go check out the video with, I forget his name, but the potential owner of the Vegas team sat down with Elliot Friedman, I believe, to talk about uh, the Vegas team, and he says his preference would be the Black Knights. And to me, that's a pretty cool name. Yeah, and like I would be thrilled with that name. 
it's actually one of the few times that I've liked the thought of an owner for a team name. Like, I remember when the Hurricanes came in, the owner wanted to name them the Ice Hogs or something like that. And it's like, um, no. <laughs> you know, the only thing is you'll get a team who named the Black Knights and they'll probably have some third jersey that's red or blue or green or something. Oh, yeah. But, you know, you know as soon as they're called the Black Knights, you auto- automatically know what color this team's going to wear. But I think that's a pretty cool name, the the Black Knights. Yeah, like if they did up the jerseys in like black and gold, like that would be... That'd be sweet. Yeah, like that'd be really sharp. Even a black and silver color would be nice. Uh, you're getting a little closer to the Kings, though, if you go that route. Yeah, that's true. But, I mean, there's so many teams that have similar jerseys. Look at, say, Anaheim and Pittsburgh. True. The other thing I think that would be interesting about NHL in Vegas, I think it would redefine the NHL experience. I think that having as much money as you'd have in this arena, which is supposed to be built by MGM, I think having the Vegas experience there, it would really be very different in what the fan experience would be from any other game in the league. I could see them having entertainment during the intermissions. I just think that it might even set a new bar for other teams to change what it's like to go to a live game. Yeah. It'll be interesting. Like, it... It'd certainly be different from every other market. I don't know what the strengths and the pitfalls would be until we get there. It, you know, it's a completely different thing. And what I hope doesn't happen is the NHL doesn't go there almost as a gimmick. And then three years later, the guy goes, yeah, I don't want this team anymore. And we either have shut it down or have another team in dire financial straits. Yeah. Well, like, the worst-case scenario in a situation like that is that you would relocate them to, like, Kansas or even Cleveland or something, but, yeah. It's but, I mean, they, they're th- having a hard enough time with two teams they need to relocate, much less having a third one there be in there, and a team that wouldn't be very good at that point yet either. Yeah, it's one of those things that this will either be a unbelievable success or a complete disaster, and... Who knows? Like, that's why none of the other leagues around have put a franchise there. Because who knows exactly what you're going to get. Yeah, very true. I hope that before the NHL actually pulls the trigger, I mean, we know this team probably won't start play next year. I hope that we see a couple more test games in Vegas to try that out. Maybe they put an all-star game there. Maybe we have a couple more exhibition games. I know they've done some, but I'd like to see some more testing in vegas may um just to see what that audience looks like yeah and what that rink looks like and that sort of thing oh we'll see like i'm curious to see how the owner's season ticket drive will go like if they get ten thousand plus seats sold then i think they'll be good yeah and but even then as i said earlier i think that you'll see a lot of those to corporate and hotels and i'd be curious to see how many of those are sold to private citizens True. How much of a regular fan base you're going to have. So, Matt, we're running running a little bit short on content this week because there hasn't been a lot that's happened besides the Flames' uh, you know, losses this week. But an interesting story that came out was Elliot Friedman talking about the Flames showing interest in uh, Chris Stewart of the Buffalo Sabres. He said that the Flames have been kicking tires on Stewart and that the return for Stewart wasn't anything they weren't willing to give. It's not like this guy's going to cost you, you know, Monaghan and Goudreau. And I guess Friedman thought that the price was very doable. We know this trade isn't going to happen right now because we're in the Christmas roster freeze, but what are your thoughts on Chris Stewart? Do you think that he'd fit in well here? Do you think he's a player that's worth going out and acquiring for the Flames? Honestly, it, he's a weird player. And, like, he's a big player, he's physical, he's got a good slap shot. It's just, he is lazy, and it, like, he only has, I think, four points for Buffalo this season. I don't know. Like, he is a big physical right winger, and the Flames do need that in the system. I just, you know, wish that there was a better option if you're going to go and get somebody to address that position. Like, uh, we've had enough of Re- Rene Bork. Stewart's more or less that guy. I don't know. On paper, to me, Chris Stewart looks like a good flame. I mean, he's big. He's six two. He's 228 pounds. He's a right winger. If you look at all that, he's, you know, an 18th overall pick. He looks like the kind of player that we'd want here. 
But you're right, he hasn't had a great season point-wise, and I think for a lot of Flames fans, we've been soured by this Devin Setaguchi experiment of bringing in a guy who was once good and try to give him an NHL spot there. Yeah, like if it costs, say, like Setaguchi plus uh, one of the Adirondack depth guys, then, you know, like even upwards of Max Reinhardt, then maybe, but even then I wouldn't, it wouldn't be like number one of oh I have to do this now. See and and looking at Stewart's contract, he's got uh, this year left, but he's uh, four point two million this year. And I think if you're talking to Buffalo, even though we've got the cap room, I don't think I'd give up much for that. If they want to give me that for future considerations or some low end prospect because they want to try and clear the cap, fine, I'll take him. But I think I'm not. I wouldn't even give up Max Reinhardt at this point for him. Yeah, I know, like, that would be a stretch, and I'd probably want a little something back if Reinhardt was getting traded there. I wouldn't bother, personally. Like, the Flames have enough forwards that really, I, what's your point? If the Buffalo GM called me and said, hey, I want to get rid of this kid, I got to clear $4 million off the salary cap, I'd say, fine, give me Stewart, I'll give you Setaguchi, you'll clear almost, you know, three and a half million off your cap i can swallow that for the rest of the year and that's probably the only way i would do it yeah uh, and like if you had to include a guy like kundari or some other some piece that we're probably not bringing back anyways yeah it's sort of like the nemitz trade for westgarth last year where okay who cares <laughs> Yeah, and I think we've all, I mean, on this show anyways, we've agreed that Kandari is a go-nowhere prospect for the Flames. So yeah, I'd be fine with that. But a guy like Reinhardt, I think, has some potential with the Flames, and I wouldn't give away potential at this point for Stewart. No. And, like, if some other team values Stewart and wants him for a playoff run for some reason, go nuts. I... For us, I really just don't see the point, and especially him being a forward. I don't see that as being exactly a need organizationally. Like I know a lot of the trade rumors have been like, "Oh, the Flames are gonna get such and such a forward," and it's like, but the Flames don't need that organizationally. See, the one place I could see Stewart being helpful is whenever Jones gets hurt, having him slot into Jones's slot. Yeah, but even at that rate, I'd prefer to bring up a guy like Poirier or Hanowski or, you know, eight or nine different forwards that are in the flame system. Yeah, I guess when I look at Stewart, if he was making the kind of money that, say, Setaguchi was making, I'd have no problem with it. If we could get him for less than a million, I'd say, okay, it's worth giving this kid a try because maybe he just needs a different environment. Maybe he responds very well to Hartley, that sort of thing. But at $4.2 million, I think even though we have the cap room, you're almost setting a precedent there that, hey, we're paying this guy $4.2 million and he's doing nothing. So, yeah, I think at four point two, unless I'm getting him for free almost, I'd pass. Yeah, like if in the off season, like the Flames, like I would offer him a contract for sure. Like, a, you know, give him a million bucks. I was going to say, uh, throw a million bucks his way and see what he says. Yeah, and, you know, some other team might offer him more, but, you know, if we're in July and August type of thing, same situation as Setaguchi, if, why not? He might rebound, who knows, but I wouldn't, he wouldn't be the first guy in line that I would be trying to acquire, that's for sure. And I think if I'm true living right now, and if I am going to move assets, I'm looking for somebody younger than 27 in Chris Stewart. You know, I think I'm probably looking for, I don't want to say for sure, but ideally I'd be looking for someone who's, you know, 18 to 24, because I think that's a player who's going to have more longevity and perhaps be a little bit more moldable in terms of, okay, maybe he's not having a great season, but put him into the Hartley Hushka system and we can make something out of this guy. Yeah, exactly. I think often by the time they're 27, they're set in their ways, they know how they're playing, and it's harder to get something out of that guy that late in their career. I agree. Well, Matt, no other Flames news I want to talk about. What about yourself? I'm good. It's been a really forgettable December. (laughs) It sure has. But why don't we take a little bit of time here to wrap up our 2014 year with 
each of our final thoughts on the on this half of the 2014 season, or even go back to the last season if you want to. And I'll let you get started. Yeah, this has been pretty much a perfect year for a rebuilding team. The 2014 season for Calgary, both at the end of last year through the draft free agency and this year, I don't see how you could really improve upon it. Getting a player like Sam Bennett in the draft, getting a player like Mason McDonald, Hunter Smith, how we played at the end of last season, like it's pretty much been letter perfect. And even with the eight-game losing streak this month, oh well, it, that was the first hook, hiccup of the entire year. I have absolutely no complaints. It's I. It's been perfect. To me, I think if I look back at other years, I think 2014 for me was the year that showed that the Flames are serious about turning a corner. We traded Jerome McGinn a couple years ago. We didn't get the return fans wanted. We traded Jay Bomeister, arguably didn't get the returns fans wanted. I think that last year when um, Feaster was fired and Burke really took over, I think that was the start of the Flames saying, hey, we're doing something, but... I think that ever since last January with the line brawl against Vancouver, we've seen this team really put itself into rebuild mode. And as you said, they've been um, almost perfect in their execution. I think some of it's been luck. Some of it's been talent. Some of it's been having the right hockey people like Brian Burke in place. But the Flames have done better in one year in the rebuild than I think I can remember any other team doing. Yeah, and that helps with having such a good prospect pool prior to this year as well. Well, and I think that's one thing that we've seen in 2014 as well, is the Flames have really started to utilize that prospect pool better than they have before. Um, they've It sounds, seems like they've gotten more serious about their AHL organization. They've you know started to bring up players and key players here who um, potentially in the past we might have sent down as soon as a veteran got healthy. And as much as this eight-game losing streak is disappointing, I think to me, if I look at it, we expected them to lose a lot more games than they did. So to me, all those eight losses we would have expected elsewhere just happened to have piled up one after another. But I think if you look at the net result and the points the Flames have, there's still something to be proud of there for Flames fans. Oh, yeah. And like if you look at the three last-minute comebacks in November, if you balance that out with three games during the losing streak that we probably should have won that is more or less equivalent it's just unfortunately the bad luck happened all at once instead of spread out 2014 is the first year in a while i've heard casual fans excited about this team in a while uh 2004 everybody jumped on the bandwagon shortly after people started jumping off and I'm talking to people both online and in person who really are getting behind this team again. Even if they're not huge hockey fans, they're loving the Calgary Flames story. And I think, to me, that's one of the most important parts of the rebuild is not just rebuilding on the ice and in the office, but almost rebuilding that talent base as well. And I think it's great that you know everyone's talking about the Flames. They've given us a lot to talk about, and I can't wait for 2015. Yeah, and I just hope that the management... It- keeps on what they're doing not rushing things being patient just evaluating things as they come and letting the kids develop and having adirondack being one of the top teams in the league that'll help down the road because the fact that these players will have grown up together in a winning environment and Hopefully, down the road, that transitions to the Flames winning together as a group and hopefully winning a Stanley Cup in a couple of seasons. I think, too, one of the things that's really helped in 2014 is the Flames have more hockey minds in the office than they ever have before. Usually, it's been our GM, and that's it. And, I mean, now we've got Brian Burke, we've got Trill Living, we've got... Um, you know, his two assistants. So we've got this wealth of hockey minds in the office. And so I think it really gives them a good sounding board. So if one person does say, hey, let's rush this, let's go out and, you know, acquire somebody to get to the playoffs, there's enough voices there. It's not just one guy making all the decisions. Yeah, and the Flames have enough scouts where we can find 
the talent from all over the place, and, you know, it's good. And, like, even, uh, like, if we're looking at some of the prospects, like, John Gillies is putting up one hell of a season in Providence, and, like, we've got a whole bunch of guys that, that are coming through, and, you know, it's just, unfortunately, the best and most important players in the organization aren't really in Calgary, and we just have to be patient and wait. And Slow and steady wins the race in a rebuild like this. It's a long-term play. Yeah, and, like, it... To liken it back in Flames history, we're like the 84 Flames, where it's not quite working yet. But we're getting a lot of the good foundational pieces for cup runs in the future. It's just we're not quite there yet. For sure. So I think 2015 holds a lot of promise for this team. Uh, Matt and I are going to be dark next week. We're going to be enjoying the week with our family, but we'll be back on the 5th of January. So happy holidays to everyone, and we'll talk to you in the new year. Merry Christmas and happy new year to everybody that listens, and have a good and safe holiday season, and go Flames, go. Thanks for your support in 2014, everybody. Take care. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.